This conference will now be recorded. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our weekly board chair check-in and update meeting. My name is Will Marie Newton, and I will be moderating this call. In order to avoid background noise, I ask that you please mute yourself if you're not speaking. However, you can unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question, or you can type it into the chat box. If you're calling from your cell phone, please take a moment to physically mute your cell phone as I'm unable to mute you from my computer unless I mute all participants. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and will be archived on CAVE's website under services. Thank you. There you go. Good morning. My name is Bob Rader. I'm executive director of CAVE and I'm glad to see so many people on this uh, sort of dreary uh thursday afternoon but, I don't know. but I well, thursday head, morning your headset, your headset is plugged in i think okay no. uh please mute yourselves we always spend a little time doing that first um so i want to give you a few updates on things and then patrice may have some updates as well or other members of the staff and these are uh professional development updates so uh, certainly Lisa may, Lisa may uh, make some suggestions or, or talk about these areas too. We did that quick survey yesterday um, about whether we should move these meetings to once every two weeks. Overwhelmingly, I think it was 92% thought we should do it every other week. So um, we will start doing that. I would assume we would not meet next week, but let us figure the timing out, and we will certainly uh, provide more information as soon as we can. Um, second thing, do you want to add anything to that, Lisa? I know you're on. No, the only thing I would add, which was in the survey, and for those of you who have not had the opportunity to look at it, um, as Bob said, the majority of folks who responded, which was 51 people, um, wanted to move to an every other week format however if we do need to increase the frequency of those meetings whether it be by your request or we see things happening time. that we need to share with you um we will go back to a weekly format so it's it's not set in stone but for right now it seems that every other week seems to be the preferred um time frame The second thing I wanted to talk about was the Cape Caps Convention. Uh, well, we have a string of doing them in November. Um, it was decided by the committee with the backing of both Cape and Caps this year to uh, postpone our convention. We had already decided to go to a one day convention. Uh, we're going to do it now in the spring. We realize everybody is so busy with planning okay? school planning school and so on that uh it made more sense to uh, to wait um so at this point we don't have a definite date in the spring but that's the that's the plan at this point uh certainly we will be continuing to provide professional development opportunities uh in november when we usually have our convention uh but it may be just one or two uh hour uh webinars uh just like we we sort of did in uh in august for our summer leadership conference when i add anything to that lisa of course i do <laughs> <laughs> uh, just that you know we are so very much aware of all that is on the plates of superintendents and board members right now we we just could not see engaging folks that are who are board members or superintendents in the planning process as we always do and on top of that, engaging you in a meaningful day or day and a half of professional development, knowing that you're really focusing on the safety um, and well-being of those in your care in the district, um, as well as the education of the students. So we just didn't want to tear um, board members or superintendents away from that in any way, shape, or form. As Bob said, we plan on doing a one-day professional development, um, we'll call it a spring leadership conference. Um, sometime in the spring, a date to be determined. Um, it will be one day. It won't necessarily have all of the features of the Cape Caps Convention. So more than likely, I'm thinking it may not have an exhibit hall, those sorts of things, but it would still be a robust professional development opportunity for you all. Um, more will be coming about that. Um, 
And as Bob mentioned, we have professional development opportunities coming up both in October, which Bob didn't mention, our Legal Issues Workshop, a four-day series of programs that you can certainly go on our website and register for, um, as well as we will be doing some um, professional development in November. So just keep your eyes open for emails from us and certainly reach out should you have any questions. But we want board members and superintendents to do the jobs that you're supposed to be doing, which is focusing on the things in your district right now. And when we, when it seems that things are um, in such a place that you can focus on some of the other things, which are also important, but not as important as health and safety, then we will um, revisit that opportunity for the spring. And you should know that um, we are working with the Yale Center for Emotional Intelligence. That's uh, Dr. Mark Brackett and, and Scott Levy. Um, as you might have seen, uh, they are going to do a course in the next few weeks. It hasn't been completely set up, uh, but we can still register for that. That's a free course that is only available to Connecticut educators and board members, superintendents, teachers, and principals, of course. Uh, but that might be something you want to look into. You'll certainly be getting more information in that on that in the next few weeks. And uh, then it will be, as I said, available to all board members, not only chairs, all board members and superintendents. So you might want to think about participating in that. At this point, I want to turn it over to Patrice for any of the uh, more s substantive but not professional development uh, activities that have been going on uh, in the last week? Uh, ju just really one thing, there have continued to be many questions about board meetings and whether you can hold them in an in-person environment. Um, in-person board meetings were never prohibited under the executive orders. We do have guidance on uh, the COVID resource page on the CAVE website. I'll be looking at that today to see if that needs to be updated in any way, but you can do either continue to do full virtual, but many boards are doing a hybrid model of board meetings where you are meeting in person for those board members that are comfortable doing that and per continuing to provide the virtual option for some board members as well as all the members of the public. And that is allowable. Uh, the rationale being that since you wouldn't have any way to gauge how many public members might want to attend in person, you would not necessarily be able to provide for the physical distancing that you can for board members uh, when they're set up at, at a, uh, a series of meeting tables. So hopefully that's helpful to you and um, we will be, be re-examining the guidance. Thanks, Patrice. Uh, now I want to start our uh, discussion today. Um, when we looked around and saw what was going on, we thought it would be helpful to talk to uh, some principals. Um, we're very lucky to have with us Nancy E. Bean. She's the Glastonbury High School principal, as well as Matthew uh, Leskowski. Hope I said that right, Matt. Um, he's a principal in Stanford at the Ripawam. Uh, middle school and we're going to talk to them but before um we do and again i thank them for both coming on i'm going through this morning the latest version uh of education week article covid19 may drive principals to quit uh certainly the the what the article talks about is the physical and emotional strain uh that that's been taking place 45% of principals, now this is nationwide, um, so uh, hopefully it won't hit Connecticut as hard as it has in other places, but 45% of principals said that pandemic conditions are prompting them to leave the job sooner than they had previously planned, according to the National Association of Secondary School Principals. Slightly larger share, 46%, said that the pandemic has not changed their plans. So many are still hanging in, uh, but certainly in a, this article said that about 20% in a usual year uh, would leave the principalships. 
Um, and certainly we hope we're not going to be up in anywhere near the 45% range because it would uh, pretty much wreak havoc on our, our school districts. But I just want you to be aware of that. Uh, it's a good article in Education Week this week about it. If anybody uh, wants a copy of it, please let me know. So Nancy and Matt, I'm gonna sort of turn it over to you. I guess our first question, and, and after I uh, ask this, I'll give you time to speak, is what was opening like? Nancy, would you like me to go first? Sure. Okay, so um, in terms of, oh, so I'll just give you a little bit of context. In Stanford, we're using a hybrid model. So our students are coming in on a, a basically an A, B alternating schedule. We do not have set days of the week. We just look at our school calendar and we've alternated essentially A, B, A, B. So, um, you know, there was some pushback originally with that because some some families really were asking to have set days for their work schedule. Um, I can tell you, for, I, I was the subcommittee chair for the middle school teaching and learning reopening uh, task force, basically. And from a teaching and learning standpoint, we looked at set days when in comparison to our school calendar and there's a lot of Mondays off at the beginning of the year and, and other days for for a variety of reasons and so the continuity really was disjointed by having an alternating hybrid plan it allowed the number of days to be equitable and it also created the most continuity of learning for us and it also gave students the, the greatest number of days in school so that that led us to the decision um, for, for our hybrid model. We have about 20% across the district who have opted for full distance learning. And my school in particular is about 820 students, grades six through eight, and we're right about 20.8% uh, full distance learning. So we're in the low to mid 600s who are coming in. Um, first two days, so those we had two first days really, right? With that A group and then the B group. Um, they both went extremely well, all things considered. Our first day, the, the two biggest items that gave us challenge were arrival and dismissal. And it was, I planned our specific arrival and dismissals to be overly conservative. I wanted to err on the side of caution in terms of kids coming into the building, not bottlenecking at any entrance. And so it created a line of cars that ran out onto um, one of the main roads. So we were able to assess very quickly. And on our B day, there was no backup whatsoever. And we were able to get it down to about 16 minutes, um, which is still long. But keep in mind, th those students needed to know where to go first period. And although we have it posted on our Power School Parent Portal, many students just had trouble accessing that prior to coming into the building. So um, today was our second day for our A group students. And it was a rainy day, which created another level of um, challenge, but uh, <laughs> we had no backup and we were we were at about 14 minutes. So I anticipate on a nice day, we're going to we're going to be able to get all of our students in the building. Um, and probably right around 10 minutes, which I think is is pretty good, all things considered. Uh, we've had no compliance issues with students wearing masks. We have given all of our teachers 10 um, disposable masks just as a backup if a student comes in, forgets their mask or doesn't have one on. Um, teachers have desk shields if they would like. Um, for us, the two things that are mandatory for everybody are six feet of social distance and, and a, a face covering, so covering your mouth and nose. And then we have available layers in addition to that, such as a face shield. Students will be given, we don't have them yet, um, personal desk barriers that are made of plexiglass. And so um, all teachers also have a canister of disinfecting wipes and students are allowed to use those if they want when they enter the room to clean off their desks or chairs. Um, we have installed hand pump stations at all the uh, doors in, in every classroom. So we have a little bit of a routine. Students enter one by one, they get a pump of hand sanitizer, sanitize their hands, and then they go sit down. Um, you know, lunches, so we, we now 
we have two teams, a team A and a team B at each grade level. Um, team A goes, we're lucky we have two cafeterias. So team A goes to our main calf, team B goes to the cyber calf. We pulled out all of the tables and we replaced them with desks six feet apart. So I did have a little bit of a log logistical issue with pulling out half the desks of the classrooms and this solved the problem of storage by putting them in the calf and using them for, for lunches. And so we, we put letters on the floor in front of each row of desks, and then we put a, a unique number. So A1, A2, A3, all students have assigned seats for lunch. They were given that before they arrived to their, to their lunch wave. They came in, we assisted them to getting to their desks, and our lunches have gone very smoothly for the last two days. Dismissal, um, we basically call into rooms. And so we used to call rooms over the loudspeaker. And what that's always created is middle school students want to leave as soon as they know the dismissal process has begun. So by calling directly into the rooms, um, it does eliminate on the amount of students wanting to leave. And so that's gone very smoothly as well. The biggest issue on the first day was students needing to know where their bus was, was located and what bus they're taking. So we just gave several lists to teachers and stacked the deck with the amount of support staff who, who are outside to, to guide students to where they need to go. And I, you know, I think that's pretty much everything. Obviously, if there's questions, I'll, I'll be happy to. But Nancy, um, I'll let you speak because I just said a whole lot. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. I think you covered it. Um, we had a <laughs> similar uh, uh, schedule in, in, um, at the high school, Glastonbury High School. As a district and as a high school, our main focus was safety. Sadly, teaching and learning was the second, uh, third priority, social and learning, social and emotional learning, and thirdly, teaching and learning. So our focus was safety. Um, for that reason, we um, provided masks, if need be, to teachers. Um, we have mat, uh, face shields for teachers as well, if they so choose to. We also have desk shields um, in every classroom for teachers. Um, they also have uh, hand sanitizers in the classroom. In order to, uh, we did a hybrid approach, meaning we also split our student body. So we have approximately 2,000 students that usually attend GHS. We now have students who attend Monday through Thursday. It's an alpha split, A through K. And then we have a Tuesday, Friday, um, and the L through Z students attend. We have approximately under 20% who chose e-learning for the entire time. And then Wednesdays are e-learning for everyone to ensure that we can have a deep clean of the, of the building. We also did a block schedule. So students, um, and we have no home room. So we have students who take uh, periods one, two, three, four. The next day is five, six, seven, eight, and we rotate that. We wanted to lessen the transitions in the building, um, which after observing it, it feels like my building's empty, um, having half the population in it. We, the students have no lockers. All students, there's signage uh, throughout the building um, and on the floors. All students walk to the right-hand side. Um, the no lockers certainly in observation has um, lessened any cluster students gathering um, <laughs> with each other. We also have um, only one person is allowed out of the classroom at one time. Um, we have lunch waves, which we uh, limited to 30 minutes at a time and we have used our cafeteria we used our gymnasium in our cafeteria we have approximately 170 students two to a table in the gymnasium we have approximately um, 190 with two to sometimes three at long tables um, after the first day we realized that um, the cafeteria was a little congested. We then took over the library, which we had anticipated we might have to do. And so we now have approximately 70 students, 70 to 80 students, one to two people at a table eating in the library. All our meetings are virtual. Um, clubs is a case-by-case -case basis. Some will still meet. Um, we, it's, it's a case-by-case -case basis, basis, and some will also meet, continue to meet virtually. Um, the silver lining is that I think that the teachers actually like the block schedule. Um, and in our, in the observation of opening day, and this is our second week, um, it was very scary for teachers, administrators, and I think even kids returning to school. The silver lining is that I think I'll be able to make some, um, great instructional changes in the long, in the future. And 
the kids are happy to be back in the building. That's great. That's great. Um, have you had any problems with uh, your students wearing masks? I was hoping you wouldn't ask me that because at this point, absolutely no problems. But um, <laughs> I don't want to put a I don't want to put a hex on you. But I do think this um, school, as we know it, is completely different. And um, it was, as you know, Matt, it was a moving target all summer. And I just kept saying school's different. And so let's say we do have an issue with someone who is disobeying. We can now just say you can e-learn from home because our teachers are, t I, I, I neglected to tell you this, our teachers are um, teaching the classroom, but zooming in students that are e-learning from home. So that's an option. At this time, no, but every school year starts kind of smoothly <laughs> overall. Um, I think our kids really want to be in the building. And even though uh, the schedule we provided um, allowed students to see their teacher at least once a week um, and then most two times a week, and they want to be here. So I think um, I, so far, good. Good. Good to and hear. Bob, I can just oh, hey. back that real quick. You know, not to jinx it. Also, we've we've had really great uh, compliance with with our mask policy at our school. I think there was one student so far in the three days we've been open who forgot their mask, and I directed them right away to a staff member when they entered the building, and they were able to get a mask immediately. We we had similar um, changes to lockers. We have no lockers anymore. And so uh, our distance learning model or e-model as Nancy describes it, and, and th we, we did a couple trials in the summer of trying to live stream and we felt that our infrastructure and hardware just weren't at a place where, where we were, we felt comfortable. And so I, in the trials served the, the role of the student and in, in a few cases, I was getting frustrated trying to get the attention of the mock teacher and, and, and I'm thinking if I'm, a, if I'm a middle school student or any student for that matter, one of two things is going to happen. I'm either going to get frustrated and disrupt the class or I'm going to shut down completely. And so for our situation, we just felt like that wasn't the best approach. So we have consolidated our distance learning sections. So my teachers teach five times. It's not perfect, but four of those sections for the most part are hybrid and one is an exclusive distance learning section. And so far that seems to be going going well. I would um, piggyback, Matt, that um, we had a lot of discussion over the summer if it was too much for teachers and for, for students. Um, and we decided to try this. We, we already had a one-to-one -one iPad um, initiative for the last five years. Um, and I think right now teachers are balancing how to operate that and we've really taken a less is more approach, go slow and with the block schedule when something's not going right you don't have to um, rush because you only have 44 minutes. Um, I walked into a, I observed a class this morning and this teacher had the students e-learning from home, all their faces up behind him um, on the screen, breaking them out into um, groups. This was a teacher who's well advanced in um, technology, and I don't think that all of my teachers are able to do that at this time, but um, we wanted as much contact kids to teachers, and it was an area that we wanted to focus on because um, we, we went out in March, um, People weren't used to Zooming. People maybe not had as, as much contact with kids as we um, needed to as we move forward in this crisis. Did, did either of your uh, schools have staffing problems this year? Uh, did you have to make a lot of adjustments uh, because of the COVID crisis? Absolutely. Um, people's roles have changed dramatically. It's all hands on deck. And so when we start, when I started the school year, what we, what we thought we would be doing, I'm sure Matt, you didn't think you'd be doing what you're doing. And um, so paraprofessionals, we, because of the block schedule, we looked at, obviously we followed all IEPs, but paraprofessionals, um, we have a working center. So teachers, um, kids who might be attending a different district and have a different model, if they needed daycare, we have a working center in the building. 
I need people to cover that. I need people to cover a teacher who's e-learning or e-teaching from home. I need someone in that classroom. Um, so yes, I think that will be a major challenge as we move forward. Mm. And so in, in Stanford, we actually um, had a $12.5 million deficit that we were having to problem solve, which resulted in many cuts. So programs, and it was at one point, I think 136 people across multiple bargaining units. So there's been a, a significant impact where I think regardless of whether you're an administrator, teacher, paraeducator, custodian, um, you're being asked to do more uh, with, with less people around you to support. So um, there's definitely been an impact, but we've tried to be creative to solve some of those problems. So for example, um, I reduce some of the meeting times or combined meetings, maybe done push some things to after school meeting time and increase collateral duties. And so where we've we've in the past had multiple security guards to support cafeterias and hallways, we I now have teachers filling those roles as a collateral duty instead of a mandatory meeting. So that's just one example of, of how we've had to flex how we operate to to, to meet the, the new staffing that we have. Also with our model, because we're our distance teaching and learning academy, as we call it, is a school within a school, we had to move in sections out. And so say there's 58 students who are distance teaching and learning in sixth grade. Right now for our middle school, our class size cap is 25. So the challenge is 58 students, right, is two sections um, with an overage of eight. And so if I add another section, now my class sizes are nice and small in the distance teaching and learning side, but now I'm gonna have overages on the hybrid side and vice versa. So what our teachers are faced with is just mathematically speaking, we balance as much as we can, but in many cases, those class sizes are, are bigger than the, the 25 uh, max that, that's been in place for several years. And, and when we did our alpha split, that doesn't mean when um, a teacher looks at their class list and starts the day that that's going to be an even split for half our home and half our in. Um, there was no way to really manage that. We talked about having all ninth graders stay home at one point, or but we have a lot, we have a lot of mixed classes, and so there are there are a few there are classes that have maybe 17 students in class and for e-learning from home. And so that is um, a challenge for our teachers. Okay, I see we have one question at this point and please, those attending or participating, uh, please feel free to, to ask questions. Um, oh, now I see another one. Um, let me start with the first one. I just have to find it again. Or, Will Marie, would you like to read them? You do such a nice job anyway. <laughs> so I only have one question. Um, the first question I have here is says, have you started to get a sense of, of the class distinction based on now entering into people's homes on screen? Have you anticipated anything like that? I'm not sure if I understand the question. Okay. It, it John, was John, John. Do you want to ask your question? Not in terms of school classroom, but class class. <clears throat> um, when you actually enter into a student's home and you see the background and you see their living environment, there are it's fraught with potential problems. That was the nature of my question. Uh, absolutely, we have we've had um, uh, well zooming into the homes is not new since March because we started doing it last year, but we did have some problems. Um, a student's background was a, a Confederate flag. And so um, uh, we treat that like any other investigation and handle it um, appropriately. Um, we also have had um, uh, uh, students changing their names on Zoom. And um, Zoom has um, upped their capabilities of muting, st muting students, um, 
dismissing people from the classroom. Um, so those things we're working on. Um, I think we fixed it yesterday afternoon in, we, we practiced with the teacher who was having difficulty. Um, but um, I foresee that we will have more issues like that. Thank you. Yeah, and, and, and for us, um, you know, we, we do not make it mandatory that students um, open their, their camera so they're visible we allow them to have the choice. And so we actually, part of my subcommittee work this summer was redesigning or refining our, our grading practices. And so participation in, in many ways last year uh, was looked at whether you were on a Google Meet or, or a Zoom classroom. And so we moved away from whether you were on, you got credit, and if you weren't, you were penalized. And we actually came up with things like participating in the chat, um, opening up your microphone and, and engaging in dialogue, collaborating through a Google document or a hyperdoc. And so it's actually, we're, we're looking at engagement as opposed to just being in attendance to, 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 to gauge that. So if a student feels more comfortable to disable their camera, we're certainly um, promoting that because for us, it's all about learning and not about the presentation of their room or their house or, or their faith, right? So that's the approach that we've taken locally here. And that's Bob, I, Bob, I'd like to make a comment. Can I make a mock comment? Who, who, who is that? <laughs> huh? Bob. Who is Herb, that? Herb Erico, <laughs> Willington. Oh, sure, Herb. I just, Go ahead. Uh, it's not in relation to what you're talking about now, but I just wanted to uh, mention something that I haven't heard uh, anyone talk about yet, but we we're uh, in Willington, we're a small K-8, school and uh, we have moved some of our classes uh, outside during the uh, good weather so that we're not in the classroom and just in the open so that uh, it's worked out very well and also we have a number of students that are home but uh, we're providing for them and uh, the classes are small H larger schools i can anticipate would be have more difficulty another thing we have done as some may want to think about, we're, uh, we have uh, purchased some tents, large tents, and we are setting them up on the school grounds so that in good weather, and we can probably go right up until November this way, and uh, we'll have our classes outside. Also, we have a fire department pavilion, which is right next door, and we're signing a lease with them to use that facility is also so even though we have our buildings and we're still operating within our buildings we are rotating teachers outside and uh we're it's working out pretty good really the kids love it um i i didn't mention with the block schedule which is 80 minutes we've encouraged continuously to, it uh not structured um, but for teachers to take their classes outside, we opened our patio in the cafeteria, which we haven't done in the past for kids to eat outside. Um, the kids love it, the teachers love it, and it's time for them to really actually get to know their kids better. Um, I think they love it and something that we would continue after COVID, after the crisis. Good. And, and so for us at the district level, I wasn't part of all of these conversations, but I do know there was some exploration into tents. So there were some obstacles with that. It, tents, large tents need to be permitted. And so that created one layer um, of challenge in trying to do that. As I mentioned, we had a, a large deficit that, that we had to deal with. And so purchasing and or renting tents was not necessarily an option for us. In addition, we're encouraging most classrooms to go as paperless as possible. And so using the technology that's built into inside is, is has been very helpful. And if we went outside, it would have posed more challenges to be able to go paperless in the way that we're, we're looking to do. So for those reasons, it just didn't make sense for, for us to go that route. But similar to Nancy, we certainly are encouraging our classrooms to, to go outside when appropriate, to utilize outdoor space for mask breaks. And one of the things that I'm actually looking to do, and I wanna train my staff on this because we're certainly not all experts, is starting every single class with 30 seconds of mindfulness. And so for us, our policy is if you take your mask off inside, you can't talk. And so it, you take any student, 
elementary, middle, or high school and say, take your mask off, but don't <laughs> don't say anything. Um, they're naturally going to want to talk. So if we engage by saying, okay, we turn the lights off, please close your eyes, take your mask off, and just go through a, a quick 30-second activity, it will help center the students to be ready to learn while also giving them a much needed mask break at the beginning of every class. So that's something we're definitely looking uh, to, to build our capacity on and, and roll, roll out in the next couple of weeks. At the high school, we we um, did require students, we are requiring students to turn on their video and we are trying to um, be much more structured in grading, attendance and participation, much more than we were last spring. We were very flexible. Um, I think the feedback we received from teachers and um, they needed more accountability of students. And I think we're in a different place than we were in March. Um, as for um, masks, we, the only time a student's allowed to have a mask off is when they're eating um, or they're outside taking a mask break. Okay, I, I found the second question. It's from Karen, um, and we're sort of running out of time, but what are you hearing from teachers? Do they appreciate the early uh, PD days? Did that make a difference in building uh, the confidence to come back? <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll go, Nancy. Um, I, you know, I, I think the the time afforded teachers two things. So one, certainly the time to collaborate and build their capacity on this new way uh, of education. So we were thrust into distance learning in the spring, and now we're going into a hybrid, which although it has some components of traditional in-person and some components of distance, it's totally new because now you have to balance both of those worlds. So giving giving staff opportunities to engage in PD on, on not necessarily best practices, but engaging ways to, to use flipped classroom and blended learning that lends itself well to a hybrid. So, and then giving them collaborative time. So not just pushing information to, to them constantly, allowing them time to interact with each other to, to create units and lessons that they may have done in the past but that are now relevant to the to the new way that they that they're they're teaching this year. Um, I also think just having a little bit more time to get the building ready to get their minds ready was also helpful, separate of of any professional learning that that occurred. I think that those two things were definitely a help to to teachers. I would concur with Matt. I think the biggest thing was for it was the first time some of my teachers stepped into the building since last March and were around people, obviously socially distancing, but it was very, um, they were scared. And I think that those extra days were really pertinent to their, their emotional wellness um, and their health and their wellness and their mind. Um, I thought it was a great time for, um, it was all virtual, but they could t independently um, uh, we focused on technology and also it was time, a uh, great time for them to be able to coll collaborate with their uh, colleagues. Great, great. I want to thank the both of you. Please stay on if you'd like to. Uh, Nancy Bean and, and Matt Laskowski. Um, we now go to a board chair share. Uh, Patrice, uh, you ready for our uh, board chair share? where they talk about it, the issues for, that they have. Go ahead. I'm ready for all the sharing. I want to put oh, one great. question out there to uh, the, the board members, the board chairs, and that is, how are your board members doing? We know that times of crisis can bring groups together. It can also exacerbate uh, pre-existing challenges. So re reminding you that this call is being recorded and will be available on the CAVE website. I'm not interested in particular uh, individuals being called out, but uh, it would be helpful to know how is your board doing as a board and how are your board members doing? Anyone want to share? I can. Um, my, this is Deborah Kane and I represent Middletown. Um, I think our board members are very stressed out um, only because there's so much and so 
many questions and I think with the high level of uh, uncertainties, I'm hoping that it will level off in the next couple of weeks. Our teachers were very, uh, as many of you said, you know, alarmed or nervous about going in. Um, but on the first day and the second day, they were really like, you know, things went smoothly. You know, we're impressed. We're glad to be back in school. We're glad to see our students. Um, things went well. It was a couple of quirky things as expected, but, you know, um, I think as things level out, they will feel better. But, you know, we have comments from parents on Facebook and I, and I try to tell my board members, you know, don't be so uh, consumed by it. Um, the best thing that we could do is provide the proper chain of command and let them know that we have all the information on the website, trying to get our parents very um, acclimated with looking at the website so they can get their questions answered right away. Also having um, technical support for them when they need help, just making sure that we have things lined up so that we can um, alleviate those stressors that our parents and our teachers have. But um, I'm hoping we're trying to, to make sure and try to assure everyone that things are on track and they're moving. So I think in the next couple of weeks, not just the Middletown Board of Ed, I, I'm hoping that all of the boards will level off and you know feel better about going back to school. Thank you. Deborah, thank you very much for sharing that. And you, you raised the very important point of the role of board members, particularly in a time of crisis, is to help their community, whether it be parents, uh, teachers, understand where they can find information, who they can go to, to get their questions answered. Uh, and also to, to show leadership by being that um, steady, confident uh, voice, even in a time when there is so much uncertainty. Anyone else wanna share how things are going with your board members? I've, I see a comment uh, that in Clinton, some members are all in, um, some are finding it difficult to fulfill their board role because of challenges in their own lives outside of the board. Uh, and the board chair is trying to make it clear what they are responsible for and what's the responsibility of the superintendent, CIAC, the Department of Public Health. That's another very important point, the whole issue of roles and responsibilities. You are not the health experts. Uh, some of you do have some, some background and some expertise in that area, but you are serving as a board member. Uh, you're still the policymaking body, and you are not going to make the call as to whether a school is closed for two days of deep cleaning and contact tracing. That's going to be public health officials and and your superintendent making those decisions. I think in Brantford, um, aside from the fact that two members of our board have resigned um, pretty much after the start of our school year, our administration has been running on autopilot virtually um, in both senses of the word. They, uh, we met as leadership teams with the superintendent, assistant superintendent, board chair, vice chair, and secretary, and that we funneled out to the remainder of the members on the board just to kind of streamline um, our roles. Uh, so board members have been informed. They've been able to ask questions. We have not really met up until a couple of weeks ago when we had a town hall on reopening, and that was massive with over 600 questions being posed by um, over 130 participants from the community. So it, it feels like it's been different for us from other boards who have been meeting and, and wrestling with their challenges, um, but it's worked so far. Good. And, and we'll point out that the resignation of your two board members was not prompted by the discussion that I had with your board about roles and responsibilities. The first thing they said was, all right, we're out of here. No, it had nothing to do with that. <laughs> they were actually very pleased with that. 
it seems to be successful. Patrice, I would like to thank um, Kate for, I had to also go on your website to look for the roles and responsibilities for board members. Because I think that, you know, our superintendent had so much on his hand, you know, he said he receives three to 400 emails a day. And then you had um, board members also sending uh, three to four emails a week to the superintendent. And I have to say, you know, you have to understand that the superintendent has his hands tied to try to hold your question. If it's not something that's going to expose the board or the superintendent to try to hold your questions and your inquiries until the board meeting. And just also letting them know that, um, and, and I said that earlier, you know, the best thing that you could do is give a parent or a teacher uh, the, the line of command, who to contact, what your questions. I said, just so, I said, because we're not involved to the, in the day-to-day -day activity. And I think that's very hard for board members to understand that you're right, we're here to, um, hire the superintendent, look at the policies and procedures, and not is and not get involved in the day-to-day -day activity. But I think it's so hard to decipher when you're a board member because you want to be involved. Um, and what I would like for Kate to do is just also put out a list of things that people should not get involved in. Just to, to, <laughs> just to be clear, just to give some type of guidance because um, you know, sometimes they, they are confused, but I did send the list that is outlined in Cade just so that our board members have a clear understanding and, and I think that it's working. So thank you for that outline. Oh, you're, you're welcome. To, uh, and we're gonna use you as an ambassador for the role of the, the board chair in, um, you know, sort of managing the board, particularly in a time of crisis. I know some board chairs have said to their members, S send me your questions first, because five of you might have the same question. And that means we'll only have to send one email to the superintendent, not five. That's I think that's point. an interesting point that um, more and more public citizens, uh, parents, are finding their way to who their board members are that never knew or never cared before. So I think there's a whole lot more um, of public elevation of what the role is and what your responsibilities are and what people think your responsibilities are. Sorry, this is Sheila from CABE. Thanks, Sheila. And Nick reminds everyone, it, this is in the chat, but I know some of you are calling in. Um, CABE is happy to come out or virtually come to your board meeting uh, and talk about roles and responsibilities. And it's often helpful to reinforce uh, the work of the board chair who is, is, is trying to help their members sort through that. I note that particularly several of you have commented that you have uh, new board members, who, some of whom have never experienced a pre-COVID Board of Education meeting. So some of them are this month experiencing their first in-person meeting. That can be challenging. They don't have this, the obviously the relationships uh, that those of you who have been meeting in person for years have, uh, and that, that creates its own challenges. Uh, someone else has commented, again, they have five new members on the board and they are finding it a particular challenge. Um, and that those board members that were were effective tree seems to be having some connection issues. We realized the other day that we have some bandwidth issues in the office when a number of us are here and we're trying to be on the same teleconference. Uh, so let me help Patrice out at this point until she can come back. Other questions, comments, concerns that you think we should know about as we move forward? I just want to say that I'm really thankful for hearing from other board chairs and from the two principals so that when we meet with our 
different publics, we can talk about challenges so that they, number one, don't think that we're making things up, or number two, that we're alone in this, and that other districts have challenges that may be very different from ours, um, and that we're all really trying our best. So even just something as simple as saying, because of the hybrid schedule, we actually had two first days of school for our kids. Um, this sounds simple, but it's something that many parents probably don't even think about. So that's uh, that's been huge. Thank you. Others. Another question I see, has anyone figured out how to have a public meeting in person with a 25 person limit indoors? The camera's right there, so I'm gonna push this. Um, I, can you hear me, Bob? Yeah, yes, I can hear you, Patrice. What, what I would say is uh, that that's why boards have continued the virtual option for members of the public. It's many of you do have spaces, your your gymnasium, your auditorium, where you can certainly set up the board so that they are physically distanced uh, and then continue to provide for the access to the public, which is allowed under the executive orders uh, through the virtual option. Patrice, this is Julie and Canton. I'll, I'll just tag on to that because um, when we we're doing that very thing in, in Canton and had our first meeting that way this past Tuesday, it, it's a little clunky, I'll be honest, especially when you're all sitting and we have computers in front of us with earbuds in and you you there's a delay between the technology and being in the room. But I would just encourage boards to reach out to their operations people because when we were talking through what we wanted to do and at one point we talked about having the public sign up, but um, our operations person pointed out that they couldn't control where the public might go because we meet in our high school. And that was a concern from a um, sanit sanitation issue and the cleaning of the school. And we didn't want public because the schools are closed, you know, at four o'clock each day. And so we didn't want public wandering around the building that we didn't, that might leave the meeting and go off and do that very good point and, and that is another reason uh that districts have uh not invited the public back into their buildings many of you adopted opening protocols that uh restrict visitor access to your buildings whether whether the students are in the building or not Are there other questions, uh, suggestions? Hmm? Bob, do you see anything else in the chat? We just received one question. It says, how is live streaming classes going for other districts? Great question. We heard a little bit of that from uh, the two principals uh, earlier. Uh, one, Glastonbury doing live streaming and Stanford uh, having determined that they didn't really have the technological capacity to be able to do that effectively. How about other uh, board chairs? What's been your experience? It's going well in Windsor. Going well in Windsor, great. And we're and we're in the hybrid. So when the high school and the middle school are both on block schedule now, the middle school for the first time on block schedule. And um, outside of a teacher here and there having Wi-Fi issues within the building, it's been very seamless. And we're on Google Classroom, just as a reference. Well, Marie, I think there's another question in the chat. If you could read it, please. Yep. 
those in the hybrid model now, do you have plans to switch to full in-person soon if the health data supports that? Great in question. Windsor, in Windsor, I believe the date is October 5th. At this point, we're committed to the hybrid. We're to understand and we're prepared to go to full five days or go strictly distance. So we're prepared for all three scenarios at any, any given point in time. Same Anyone else? Yeah, same in Brantford. Bloomfield will go instantly to a virtual if we have to. Uh, hasn't been a lot of discussion yet about going full face to face. I'm kind of kind of waiting to see this uh, if COVID comes back again. And Clinton. And Clinton also has the October 5th date for a possible transition to all in. All right, it sounds like it you, sounds uh, go ahead, uh, go ahead. Uh, Patrice, don't. we did get one, don't. we did get one. <laughs> Um, in Woodstock, we're committed, um, to, Woodstock, hybrid we're committed now, to hybrid for now, but we'll reassess based we'll on health data at the end of the month. At the end of the month, and hope to have everyone back. Hope we're K through eight. Back. We're K through eight. So it sounds like you all so have like all uh, have, have had uh, successful reopenings. Had successful reopenings and have good and plans in place plans uh, and are working effectively with your administration effectively with your administration okay with that Okay, with, that, with that, I think we should um, that, think end we this should, week. Um, we'll be in touch with you about when our next chair uh, check-in will be. Uh, and and I want to just thank everybody very, everybody very much and good luck as you move forward. Take care, everybody. Have a good day. Be safe, Have everyone. Be safe. Let's see what happens when we have JR today. Thank you, Bob. Um,